Hello, and welcome to episode number 138, where I speak with Dr. Akhil about his book, The Paleo Vedic Diet, where he combines the core principles of paleo with the science of Ayurveda. We also discuss in detail gluten and dairy and protein and good fats versus bad fats, and also talk about reducing your exposure to toxins. So please stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Elements of Ayurveda, Empowering Wisdom of Life. I'm your host, Colette, and in this podcast, I hope to empower you to take charge of your own health by sharing the holistic teachings of Ayurveda, the ancient healing tradition from India. We will also discuss topics like health and wellness, nutrition, yoga, fitness, meditation, breath work, and much more, as well as interviewing lots of inspiring people along the way. My humble wish is to help you to connect to your true nature, to Mother Nature, and to each other. If you like the content, be sure to subscribe to the show, and the new episodes will automatically download for you to enjoy. If you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend you listen to the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. I've also set up a Facebook group for us to connect and to support each other. And I'd love for you to join me over at Elements of Ayurveda podcast group. And now here's the show. Hello and welcome to Elements of Ayurveda. Today, I'm very happy to introduce you to Dr. Akhil Palanasamy, MD. He is an integrative medicine physician, educator and author. He blends his Western medical training with functional medicine and Ayurveda. Dr. Akhil studied biochemistry at Harvard University, received his medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco, and completed his residency at Stanford University. He also completed a fellowship in integrative medicine with Dr. Andrew Wheel at the University of Arizona and is certified by the Center for Mind-Body Medicine at Georgetown University. He is the author of The Paleovedic Diet, a complete program to burn fat, increase energy, and reverse disease. Dr. Akhil studied Ayurveda in southern India and found a powerful synergy in combining Ayurveda with the paleo diet in his clinical practice. This led him to coin the term Paleovedic Diet, which refers to a nutrient-dense, customized paleo diet that incorporates spices, specific fruits and vegetables, intermittent fasting, and an Ayurvedic lifestyle. He sees patients at the Stutter Health Institute for Health and Healing in San Francisco, where he also serves as Physician Director for Community Education. Dr. Akhil has been a consultant with the Medical Board of California for many years. He is a dynamic and highly sought-after speaker who has spoken at numerous conferences and venues worldwide. And Dr. Akhil, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Oh, I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me on, Colette. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed this book. It was actually given to me by a friend. And mm -hmm. in reading your book, it was very clear that your health journey played a significant role in your career, but also how you came to write this book. Uh, can you share with us this healing journey, please? Oh, sure, Colette. Yeah. So I think that like many doctors and healers, my own journey started with a uh, health crisis. Mm. And that really uh, occurred in uh, medical school. So I had finished uh, college where I studied biochemistry at Harvard and I was kind of on top of the world, you know, uh, started medical school. And mm -hmm. uh, then I developed a, a, a series of um, me medical problems, including um, like carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, chronic pain, uh, weight loss, severe fatigue, and to the point where I had to stop medical school and uh, take uh, time off to try to recover my health. Mm -hmm. And I tried all the conventional treatments, you know, physical therapy, uh, medications, um, you know, everything. And I really wasn't getting better. And it was only until I saw an Ayurvedic doctor that I um, started to improve. And she pointed out that um, I had made some um, radical changes in my diet that I thought were for the best, going vegan and, you know, making all these uh, changes. But she pointed out that that was not the right thing for my body type. And uh, um, so she helped me to make 
make changes to my diet and lifestyle, um, recommended certain herbs. And um, that really was what saved me, you know, during mm -hmm. medical school and uh, allowed me to recover my health and, um, you know, re resume medical school and uh, and then realize that, you know, diet is so powerful. Um, and, and also that each person has a different diet that's right for them. You know, I, I thought that I was um, making the, the, the best decision by going vegan. And maybe that would have been perfect for someone else. But for me and my unique, uh, you know, body type, that was not the right thing. And um, so when I started uh, resuming having some animal products and, you know, made some other changes, did some detoxification, education, um, you know, really lived more Ayurvedic lifestyle. That's really what transformed my own health. And so I immediately dove into Ayurveda because um, I wanted to share this with my future patients. And mm -hmm. so I, I began um, traveling to India um, and, uh, um, you know, where I was, uh, where I was born. And, um, but I never really uh, knew much about Ayurveda growing up. And I connected uh, with the um, place in Tamil Nadu uh, in Coimbatore, um, a place uh, called the Aryabhaidya Chikitsalayam, mm -hmm. which is an ancient uh, Ayurvedic center in Coimbatore uh, that has been treating people for uh, hundreds of years. And wow. uh, <clears throat> and um, um, took um, courses in yoga, in Sanskrit, um, in Ayurveda. I would spend my summers off during medical school, you know, living in India, kind of practicing because there was no system for what I wanted to do, which was study Western medicine and study Ayurveda. I had to create my own program. Right. And so I, I did that and uh, spent the summers there, um, uh, really, you know, delving in, practicing Ayurveda on myself, uh, you know, learning yoga, learning Sanskrit. And then um, a couple of years later, I met my Ayurvedic guru, who is uh, Dr. L. Mahadevan in uh, the town of uh, Darisanam Kop in Kanyakumari, which is also in Tamil Nadu, uh, South India. And Dr. Mahadevan is a third generation, you know, Ayurvedic uh, Vaidya or doctor, and he has a hospital. People come from all over the world to his uh, small hospital in this village in India. It's so, you know, uh, rustic and uh, it's picturesque. And um, so I um, uh, began seeing patients with him. And uh, that was my clinical uh, training, uh, you know, while I was doing medical school and then residency and fellowship, I would spend, you know, months, uh, any months off uh, and summers with him, you know, seeing patients and um uh, and really seeing lives changed, you know, by mm. by Ayurveda, where where people could not be helped by conventional medicine, and often, you know, had been told there was nothing more could be done for them, or you know, surgery was the only option, and they would come to this Ayurvedic hospital, stay, you know, two three weeks, and you know, be restored to normal health, and um, really inspired me to. Um, to incorporate Ayurveda into my uh, work. And I think my passion for Ayurveda really came from seeing the impact on, on these people that, you know, no one else could help. Right. And on yourself, um, which is amazing, the fact that you, you know, had to pause medical school for a moment in order to take care of your health. But what has come out of this journey is amazing and this combination of both the Western medical system and then these Eastern uh, science and philosophies. And you mentioned earlier, you know, how during that process of healing yourself, you found that the importance of food. Did you get mm -hmm. much training in nutrition in the Western medical system? Yes, we had uh, one hour in oh. the entire four, four so. years, which is actually pretty, it's pretty typical, you know, most yeah, doctors know. Uh, get like I think one between one to four hours of lecture material in four years, you know, on nutrition. And it's really sad, but that's kind of, you know, our focus is on treating, uh, training about medications mm -hmm. and surgery and all the procedures. So nutrition is totally left out. Yeah, which is incredible, but I know there's such a mass of information to cover, but uh, hopefully now things are changing a little as we see the importance of what goes in our body to make our cells and tissues right. in the first place. So can you explain to us and those listeners who are not familiar, what is a paleo diet? Where did it originate and what's the philosophy behind it? Sure. Yeah. So basically how I came to become interested in paleo was, you know, after um, learning Ayurveda and seeing the uh, ancient wisdom and the, and the power of that. Um, and also my uh, my Ayurvedic uh, doctor, you know, she recommended that I begin taking bone broth, you mm -hmm. know, in medical school. 
And this was many years ago before it was really popular. And I, I it was shocking to me because I was a vegan and, you know, but she, she recommended it as a medicine and it was very tonifying and it was what I needed and um, at that time. And, um, and so I, I began to be curious about um, other sources of ancient wisdom, you know, so um, in, <clears throat> and started to be curious. So the paleo aspect really comes from the Paleolithic era. Um, and so with Ayurveda, we have the ancient wisdom of thousands and tens of thousands of years. So I thought, you know, why not go back millions of years and mm-hmm. see what we can learn, you know, through biology and through evolution, because um, I studied biology in college. And uh, um, so the Paleolithic uh, diet, basically the premise is that our genetic code was shaped by about three million years of living uh, as hunter-gatherers before agriculture began mm-hmm. approximately 10,000 10, years ago. And <clears throat> so our um, our genes you know, have been shaped by these three million uh, years of living as um, hunters and gatherers. And um, it's also estimated that human beings have thus lived about 100,000 generations, you know, eating a hunter-gatherer diet and only about 600 generations uh, as farmers and with modern foods, you know, in the last 10,000 years. So I began to be really curious about this and and thinking about, you know, how we can inc- incorporate the uh, ancient wisdom of our genetic history with mm. living a, a more paleo lifestyle. And in my research, I was shocked to find that um, actually uh, a paleo diet was really plant-based. And so that was really what uh, led me to, you know, the impetus to write the book because people have misunderstand that when they think about the paleo diet, they think it's like, okay, bacon and burgers and, right. you know, that because that's the modern conception. But ultimately that's inaccurate because our uh, ancestors lived on plant foods primarily. Um, you know, tubers and roots and leaves and berries and things they could gather. And very occasionally they might, you know, hunt or or fish, catch something. But um, the paleo diet really was a plant-based diet. And also what I found fascinating was the the wild plant foods in the paleo um, diet were were completely different from our uh, plant foods that we're eating now. So our modern fruits and vegetables have been bred to lose a lot of the nutrients that our ancestors uh, ate. And those are the phytochemicals. So these are all the, you know, there's about 40,000 phytochemicals, the antioxidants, uh, the flavonoids, you know, all of these that that's our primary defense against uh, disease. And what I found in my research was that um, because those nutrients are, you know, bitter or um, astringent, you know, they've been bred out by um, farmers because it's only the sweet stuff that sells, you know, right. even, even just talking about fruits and vegetables. And I'll just give you one statistic on this, which is looking at apples, you know, which everybody thinks is a healthy food. But um, when you compare um, wild apples to our modern supermarket apples, um, if you t- compare one ounce of each, the difference in phytonutrients is actually 47,000 mm. percent. Um, and uh, so um, so wow. l- so literally like a wild apple has 470 times the level of phytochemicals as, um, you know, modern apple. And um, so I realized, you know, wow, like uh, this is really where the paleo diet um, uh, shines is in the uh, the plant foods and the nutrient density. And so. Um, so that's why uh, in a, um, my book, I talk a lot about how we can recover the, the phytochemicals, you know, how we can recover the plant, the nutrient density um, with our fruits and vegetables and um, bring that back into our diet, you know, how to prepare certain foods, certain plants are better raw, certain plants, you get more nutrients cooked, um, and how to shop, how to uh, prepare, because you can't just tell people, you know, eat more uh, plants and uh, eat more fruits and vegetables, because if they're um, you know, getting the the modern ones that are very um, nutrient poor, you know, uh, yeah. then you're not really getting a lot of the nutrients that you and you might think you're eating healthy by eating a lot of, um, you know, uh, iceberg lettuce or um, golden delicious apples or, uh, you know, uh, pears or white potatoes, you know, that those are really mm-hmm. not not the way to get the nutrients that we need. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, you mentioned 
in your earlier in your own healing journey that you realized that you were eating the wrong diet for you. And that's why you're having all these, these ailments. And, and of course, Ayurveda goes in the premise that there's no one size fits all. You really need to understand your own unique mind body type. And in your book, The Paleo Vedic Diet, it comes from your belief that paleo must be individualized. And this is where you combine the core principles of paleo with the science of Ayurveda. So can you explain how you combine the two and just explain that concept to us, please? Sure. Yeah. So that's basically what I found really worked best for my patients was, you know, incorporating Ayurveda um, on top of this kind of uh, template of paleo. And um, we know that one size doesn't fit all with nutrition, but people really need uh, a lot of help to customize it and mm-hmm. figure out what's right for them. And I think that's where this combination of uh, paleo and Ayurveda really seemed to work well. And um So I think of the paleo diet as really like a starting point, you know, Mm -hmm. because obviously we can't go back a million years and eat those kind of foods. We have to start today with what we have. Um, And then we have to build on that to understand ourselves, you know, our body type um, with Ayurveda and some of the specific things that I think the guidance um, is is helpful is in terms of, you know, how, uh, for example, how much raw food uh, should you be having? You know, how much raw versus cooked? Um, uh, you know, how much protein should you, you be having in your diet? Um, you know, how much fat? This is like people really need a very concrete guidance. Yes. And I, I think that's where um, I found the combination to be really helpful to um, help people really, you know, individualize the, their own regimen. Yeah. And I do think people need these guidelines, you know, because it is right. so confusing. There's so much different information coming uh, at us these days. Um, and I think when it starts with an individual understanding their own unique constitution, that's a wonderful mm-hmm. framework. So understanding their, their mind body type and then from there building up. So I'd love to ask you a little bit more specifics now that mm-hmm. we're talking about it and what the paleo Vedic approach is to carbs and grains, gluten and fats mm-hmm. and proteins. And I'd like to take one, each one separately because I've never kind of broken yep. these down on the podcast. It would be great information. So let's start with mm-hmm. simple versus complex carbohydrates. Sure. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, um, when people think of the paleo diet, they think of something uh, very restrictive, you know, where you're you're only having like meat and vegetables, you know, that as certain books are, are saying, that's all you can have, you know, no dairy, no grains, no beans, no legumes. And I really disagree with that, you know, because I think if you look at um, anthropology, the evidence shows that our ancestors ate uh, legumes, you know, for like probably um, hundreds of thousands of years, you know, beans, legumes, um, super healthy. And I think um, also with uh, whole grains, you know, certain people tolerate them really well. Um, I think um, same thing with dairy. So my concept of the paleo diet is very broad. Um, and, um, you know, it's expanded beyond the very restrictive diet that people think of. And mm-hmm. that's my, my whole goal with uh, the paleo diet is expand the concept. And then with, um, yeah, with carbohydrates, same thing, you know, the looking back at what our ancestors ate, they ate carbohydrates, you know, they did not avoid them. They ate um, starchy tubers, they ate roots, uh, you know, they ate um, other um sort of, uh, you know, plant foods that are, that were high in, in starches, that the difference is really the quality of the, the carbohydrate, the mm-hmm. quality of the starch. So that's where, um, uh, you know, simple carbohydrates are really ones that are broken down and absorbed quickly and raise blood sugar. And those are not found in, in our ancestral diet, but examples would be like, you know, white sugar, um, a lot of like corn syrup, um, uh, you know, uh, candies, a lot of sweetened beverages where so many people get their um, simple carbohydrates. And um, so the, the highly processed carbohydrates, whereas the complex carbohydrates are um, less processed. They're including the starches that are broken down more slowly. These are your, you know, vegetables of all kinds, uh, the legumes, the beans, and then um, properly prepared whole grains. So I think those are the the sort of um, higher quality carbohydrates we should be focusing on. 
Right, exactly. Great. Thank you for that information. And then moving on, you you mentioned grains there. And, you know, we have this whole gluten free, highly processed products now. I'd love to, right. for, you know, to share your thoughts on that in regards to the Paleovedic approach. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, gluten is a very important topic. And, you know, like you're saying, gluten free doesn't equal healthy because yeah. so many of the gluten free products now, unfortunately, are just highly processed and contain other, you know, junk and stuff in there. Um, and I think um, with uh, wheat, um, certain people can eat uh, wheat and be healthy. You know, I, I've seen it. Um, I think the problem is that modern wheat is, uh, is very different. Mm -hmm. It has much more um, gluten. Um, than a uh, weed from 100 years ago. Uh, you know, if we could get um, like einkorn wheat or other ancient um, grains of wheat, uh, they would be very different. You know, mm -hmm. our modern wheat has, uh, uh, it's been bred to be much higher in starch. Um, there's more newer genetic material, in fact, that's, you know, with the GMOs in, in our modern wheat, it's much lower in nutrients. Um, and so the the wheat that we have today in our modern food supply is really different. And I think that's probably why so many people have problems with it. Yes. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think that uh, um, it's not uh, it's not for everybody. I think, you know, uh, s some people can tolerate wheat fine, um, but I think it's, it's worth looking at um, whether as an individual you have, a, you know, any type of sensitivity or intolerance. Um, and then the other factor that's very important for, for digesting wheat or any food is your um, agni, mm. of course, the, uh, you know, the, the digestive fire. And I like to correlate the agni with the microbiome, which mm -hmm. is uh, all of like the hundred trillion bacteria we have in our gut that we now know with modern research, you know, the microbiome affects every aspect of life, your metabolism, your digestion. And, um, and, you know, most of us have a, a really, um, weakened microbiome because mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, high, high levels of antibiotic use, um, loss of our kind of contact with farming and, you know, and animals and, uh, you know, rise in C-sections. There's like many factors, but we, because of that, our agni is weaker, our microbiome is weaker. We can't handle a lot of foods that, you know, our grandparents used to digest. So I think that it, it, there's a lot of factors that play into it. Um, but, um, you know, I, those are, are some of the reasons why the cards are stacked against us in terms of, uh, you know, gluten, I think. Yes, yes, I agree. And and it certainly seems to have an effect on how it's processed today as well, as well as the, the, right. the grains that are produced. Wonderful. Well, yes. thanks. Thanks for that information. And then moving on um, to the next thing I want to talk about is the good fats versus, versus bad fats. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. Now we went through decades being told that fat was bad for us. And now we almost have to retrain ourselves to, to understanding that actually fat is, is a good thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you, uh, when scientists have looked at the paleo diets of over, you know, 200 um, populations, uh, they found that they're much higher in fat than our uh, modern diets, probably around uh, maybe 40% uh, calories from fat. Uh, but the key is, again, the quality of the fat. Mm -hmm. so, um, so fats can be broken down into three categories. There's saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. That's just a difference in the chemical structure. But we need um, all three. You know, we need different types of fat. Saturated fats, again, we were told for many years are terrible. They should be avoided. Uh, they cause heart disease, all of which we know are untrue, you know, based on uh, good research now. So we need a um, little bit of all three. So let's go through each of the categories. So Thanks. saturated fats that are healthy uh, include ghee, of course. Uh, that's, you know, one of the, the best medicines for the uh, body and the gut. Um, so I, I recommend ghee. Um, pretty widely. Um, other sat good saturated fats are um, grass-fed butter, um, uh, full-fat dairy products, uh, I think, are good as well. Coconut oil is a saturated fat that I also consider to be a, a very healthy fat. So the key thing is we need a all variety of fats and we need moderation, you know, so we, we can't be having just one kind of fat. So next we have the um, monounsaturated fats, which is your uh, extra virgin olive oil, the uh, avocados, um, certain nuts, uh, and uh, 
um, you know, those kind of things. So we, we know that monounsaturated fats are, are generally very healthy. And then finally, we have the polyunsaturated fats. So this is where we have some um, some good and some bad. And so the good ones are um, fish and, you know, fish oil, um, certain certain nuts and seeds also have um, healthy polyunsaturated fats. And um, so I think, you know, having all of those the combinations of uh, fats are, are important. And then the bad ones are the processed, um, the highly processed fats, the, your trans fats, your hydrogenated oils, uh, and then vegetable seed oils are a, a big one that I um, recommend avoiding. These are your, your high um, omega-6 uh, uh, oils. They've often been very processed. So mm -hmm. this uh, includes um, soybean oil, corn oil, um, uh, safflower oil, peanut oil, even um, canola oil that some people think is healthy, but um, mm. very, very highly processed, you know. And uh, so I recommend really avoiding those vegetable seed oils because okay. of the processing and, and, and often GMO quality as well. Right, right. And so are the mono and polyunsaturated fats, are they more unstable? Or do they have a, more of a, a, a lesser smoke point than ghee mm -hmm. and coconut oil? Uh, yes, they do. Um, yeah, but I think there's a common misconception that you know you you can't cook with monounsaturated fats like olive oil. You know, people often say, "Oh, you never cook with olive oil mm -hmm. because you know it's a little low smoke point." And that, but that's uh, also a uh, misconception because they've done studies on that. And uh, um, only if you um, have a uh, if you're in a commercial you know chef's kitchen where you're repeatedly heating and you know cooling the oil and deep deep frying, that's when you should not use olive oil, but if you're cooking at home, it's really hard to um, damage or oxidize olive oil. And uh, um, the uh, antioxidants in extra virgin olive oil actually protect it from, from heating and being oxidized. So, you know, I recommend cooking with uh, olive oil. Okay, and, uh, okay. Cooking with, uh, yeah, yeah. That's so great I don't think there's any problem. Okay, yeah. that's really good to know, actually, because I was under the belief that, yeah, it wasn't to be used for in high heat. Nope, actually, okay. yeah, no, you no, you can cook with it. Okay. Um, obviously, yeah, I mean, if you're doing, you know, very high heat, then ghee or coconut oil would be good. But um, for everyday cooking, yeah, I, I will use olive oil. That's what I recommend. Okay, perfect. And you mentioned dairy there. Now, dairy is another big one that, yep. you know, the dairy industry, very commercialized and right. lots of antibiotics used, you know, lots of soy grain used. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that. We could, could do a whole podcast yeah. episode uh, on this, yeah. I know, but maybe some quick exactly. thoughts on that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Again, I think trying to go back to what our ancestors ate in terms of dairy, you know, it has to be coming from a, a cow that's grass fed, mm -hmm. um, has to be um, organic, you know, without chemicals fed to the animal, no um, hormones, no antibiotics, um, uh, completely grass fed. Um, and then, you know, our ancestors would always ferment dairy. You know, so making the yogurt, making the buttermilk, making the cheese, um, you know, if uh, certain people can tolerate milk, but for the most part, I recommend fermented dairy and also uh, full fat for sure. Definitely yeah. avoid the low fat dairy because studies have shown that low fat dairy products um, cause dis uh, hormone disruption in women. So um, that's one of the <clears throat> common things that um, if you go to an infertility specialist, you know, they'll tell you to cut out any low fat dairy because that's been shown to, you know, mess up hormones. Um, so again, it's the processing, right? right? Like we think we're making it better by removing the fat, but no, it's yeah. leading to all kinds of other problems. So full fat dairy for, for sure, and uh, always organic and grass fed. Wonderful. Yes, we got it wrong for those couple of decades. So now, now we know better, <laughs> right. we'll do better. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so another big question is always protein. Such a challenging one, it seems for many people. How much do we need, you know, whether we need meat versus being plant based, if you could just shed a little light on this subject first, that would be great, Dr. Kill. 
Uh, sure. Yeah. So I think with protein, there's a big difference based on the Ayurvedic body type. Mm-hmm. So va- vata types generally need the most protein and should have some with every meal. And uh, kapha types need the least amount of protein. And pitta types have a moderate need depending on activity levels and other things. And in terms of the source, um, like animal versus plant protein, I think that uh, either one is okay. Um, and um, I think that the decision about whether or not to have meat is a very individual one. And even if one does um, have meat, I think our paleo ancestors had mostly a plant-based diet. And, you know, it's pretty hard to um, hunt or catch uh, an animal, so they would not have meat or fish uh, uh, very frequently. So I think that a plant-based diet, you know, with or without meat is is still um, healthy. And in terms of the amount of protein, the government guidelines are for uh, 0.36 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So for a 150-pound person, that's about 55 grams of protein. So typically, I recommend between 50 to 60 grams of protein as a minimum per day. And then depending on um, activity level, goals for body weight, um, you know, illness uh, or blood sugar issues. So um, if someone has uh, blood sugar challenges, then having more protein can help stabilize blood sugar. So those are some of the factors that can uh, impact the amount of protein to have per day. Okay, great. And what's your view on protein powders, which is something that people feel Um, like they need more protein and want to add more of it into their diet? Um, Right. So again, you know, they're more processed. So for most people, I recommend uh, having unprocessed sources of protein, uh, you know, like egg or dairy or beans, uh, you know, those kind of things. And uh, um, if they have a a certain goal, like um, building muscle mass or losing weight, then they they can maybe incorporate that as a small part of the diet. Um, And I think that, uh, um, again, having organic, you know, uh, if it's a grass-fed um, whey protein, that would be that would be better than, um, you know, a conventional non-organic. So those same factors do apply. Okay, great, great. Thanks for that. And so you talk about in the book as well, the importance of reducing our exposure to toxins, because of course, we understand now that the toxins affect our microbiome, which in turn affect everything in our body and mind. So mm-hmm. what harm are toxins doing to our body? And, and what are some of the tips to avoid you know, in the following toxins, I'd like to go through like heavy metal and pesticides and mm-hmm. endocrine disrupting chemicals. So let's start with heavy metals. How do we avoid heavy metals? Where are they showing up in our diet? Sure. Yeah. So with heavy metals, um, the main ones are probably uh, lead and mercury mm. in terms of the what's common. Um, so mercury is found in uh, fish and seafood, and then certain uh, dental fillings uh, have mercury. Um, some there is a little bit in the air and water as well. Um, so it's a kind of a chronic low level exposure for all of us. Um, and then with lead. Um, Unfortunately, the biggest source of lead for many people is chocolate because uh, um, chocolate, uh, the way it grows, um, the cacao beans tend to uh, absorb lead from the soil. And uh, Mm. um, so I've had patients that, you know, would have um, chocolate every day and suddenly their lead levels are really high. And uh, um, it doesn't seem to matter whether it's organic or uh, or, or fair trade. And... um, I'm still eating chocolate, by the way. So. I think you just, <laughs> I think you just yeah. broke some people's hearts there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was going to ask, does it matter about the soil if right. it's grown in, in an organic farm? The cacao beans are grown organically, no? No, the reason is be, uh, in the countries where um, ch- uh, cacao is grown, like in South America and Africa, they had uh, leaded gasoline in their mm. environment for many years. And mm. so the atmosphere and thus the soil – um, had has a lot of lead, um, and so even if there's no other chemicals, it's the environment, the country, in fact, where right. it's, it's grown, and uh, uh, and so that's why um, that's why it's there. And so I think um, you know, it's uh, obviously there's a lot of other benefits to chocolate, and uh, having a small amount um, is fine, I think. Um, so yeah, uh, we can talk about you know, there's um, foods that are. Uh, beneficial for detox. And then, um, you know, I think uh, um, 
like you said, the, we know toxins affect the microbiome mm -hmm. and they also affect um, our immune system. You know, that's why we have such a big problem with autoimmune disease. Um, we also know they affect our um, hormones and uh, energy levels. So that's why I recommend um, I have this program I call the Paleobathic Detox, which mm -hmm. is a three three week program of certain diet and uh, supplements that people can um, really do more intensive detox. And then we can talk about um, other foods that people can incorporate. Maybe once we go through the toxins, I'll list a bunch of foods for yes, detox too. I've, def I've just noted that down here because I want to come back to that. I do have a question on the f mercury in fish. Is it true that there's more mercury in larger fish because they're eaten the smaller? Yes. Okay. So yeah, exactly. best to avoid the larger fish like the salmons, tuna, well, um, yeah, the large, like tuna is for sure an example. Um, also, like, you know, swordfish and, and those kind of things. And the ones that are much lower in, actually, salmon turns out to be lower. Okay. Um, and then the smallest fish are the safest. So the sardines, the um, anchovies, the herring, you know, um, and um, like shellfish, shrimp, um, oysters, you know, all of those uh, clams, all those are pretty low in mercury. Okay. Okay, that's great to know. Okay, so then moving on next to pesticides, and we mentioned already GMOs. How do we avoid these toxins? Um, yeah, so also a very big topic in terms yeah. of GMOs and possible effect on health. And I think that uh, safest way is uh, eating organic because they, then they're, you know, they're not allowed to have um, GMO um, components. And um, I think, um, yeah, the, the problem is the GMO foods uh, seem to also impact our microbiome. The, you know, our gut bacteria can take up genes from these um, genetically modified foods and it, it, it's un, unknown, you know, what the effects are going to be long term. Right. Um, and um, yeah, with pesticides, they, they impact the endocrine system, they impact the hormones. Um, and so safest thing would be to eat uh, organic to try to avoid those. Right. And I guess, you know, going to your local farmer's market, chatting with the local farmers, finding uh -huh. out what they're using on their soil and having a, a real relationship <laughs> with the people you're buying your produce from. Exactly. Yeah, I strongly encourage that. And, you know, Ayurveda is all about eating local and going to your farmer's market is the best way to, to do that. Right. And seasonal then. And you seasonal. Know, you'll know exactly yeah. what's in season just by going out there. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned um, endocrine disrupting hormones and, and I'd like mm -hmm. to talk about the chemicals next. Can you tell us where do they appear in our mm -hmm. lives and how do we avoid them? Um, yeah, so the endocrine system is the glands that produce hormones. So this regulates your metabolism, growth and development, sleep, mood. You know, obviously, they're very important for all those reasons. And um, certain class of chemicals called um, endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. Uh, so there, um, some of examples of them would be pesticides, uh, also uh, BPA is, is a big one, um, flame retardants, there's uh, phthalates and, um, you know, phenols. So these are found in our um, cosmetics. And that's a very big area to try to green green your cosmetics. Mm -hmm. um, they're found in plastics. So that's why, you know, avoid the BPA-free products uh, or, and also using glass and, you know, steel. Um, and they're also found in, um, you know, furniture, um, electronics, um, and um, consumer products. So I think the, the best way is um, really trying to um, look mindfully at your environment, you know, at home, minimizing the use of, uh, of chemicals, using natural alternatives, looking at your cosmetics, looking at your food containers, um, you know, and just trying to reduce the overall like exposure to these, uh, these toxins. Great advice. And I think a great resource for that, Dr. Akil, is the Environmental Working Group. They do a great job, yes. don't they? They do. Yeah. I, that's one of the resources I direct people to. Yeah. And I'll put that link in the show notes for people. It really, they do a great job at looking at products and, um, and, and all different sorts of things and, and what's safe and what's not. So thank you for clarifying that. And now let's get on to talking about, well, the foods for t detox that you recommend and uh -huh. your paleovedic detox. I'd be interested in hearing more about that. Sure. Yeah. So I think in terms of daily um, detox, 
you know, it's it's very important, as Ayurveda says, to have a healthy elimination, a normal uh, bowel movement once or twice a day. So basic stuff, you know, drinking lots of water, having uh, plenty of fiber in the diet, um, uh, so soluble fiber, which is from fruits and vegetables. So all that will help with the elimination. And then in terms of foods that I think are really superfoods, um, so one are uh, beet greens, which are the, the leafy tops of the beetroot. So those um, beet greens are, they're the richest food source of betaine, which is a natural phytochemical that supports the liver. So um, beet greens can be cooked like uh, kale or spinach, you know, just um, like a, a saute them, or you can um, have them in a salad. Uh, so with all these foods, you know, cooking is not going to inactivate the active compounds. Okay. Um, and then you also want to have plenty of cruciferous vegetables, which support the liver detox pathways. So this is uh, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, cabbage, um, kale, you know, all of those. Um, and then in terms of other compounds, um, ground flax seeds are very beneficial because they have um, lignans, which are antioxidants that help with detox. And then they help with uh, uh, binding toxins in the intestine. So I'm a big fan of uh, ground flax seed. Um, and then sulfur-rich foods also help different liver pathways. So garlic, very powerful for uh, for that for that purpose, uh, as well as um, onions, leeks, shallots, you know, all of all of those things. And then um, a couple of uh, other things I'll mention, uh, of course, turmeric, you know, hugely beneficial for so many things in terms of um, inflammation, but also it's a, a big um, uh, supporter of phase two liver detox enzymes. Mm -hmm. So people may not appreciate the detox benefits of turmeric, but, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty powerful for that as well. Um, and then Finally, I think um, chlorella is mm. a type of algae that's that's very good. Um, just adding some chlorella powder to you know like salad or smoothie um, might be really beneficial. Um, and I'll mention in Ayurveda, sweating is is really encouraged as a way to detoxify. So getting um, sauna into a sauna regularly, or um, steam room, or um, or if you don't have access to those, uh, taking hot baths, you know, right. uh, in a bath bathtub is also a really good way to detoxify through the skin, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that releases the fat soluble toxins um, through the skin directly. So um, incorporating all those regularly is is really what I recommend. Okay, great. I had a question for you on the beet greens. Um, are mm -hmm. they are they heating? Are they can they be aggravating for pitta? Um, so potentially, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think that uh, you know you have to be um, yeah with all things, of course. Right. You, know, you have to look at the uh, the body type and make sure it's compatible. Um, and then you know if you if you are, for example, a um, pitta and uh, need to have um, some beet greens, you can incorporate the um, uh, more cooling spices. So mm -hmm. maybe adding adding fennel, uh, you know, adding right. uh, coriander, adding cumin, or, uh, you know, adding some cilantro. So you can blend them to sure. moderate those those effects. Um, and uh, I think that's one way to accomplish it. That's great. And the same with the cruciferous vegetables, which can be aggravating to vat, of course, it's all very individualized, but having something like fenugreek yes. or, or fennel or something like that. Yes. And also um, plenty of oil. Um, oh, so, nice. you know, yeah, like we, uh, there have been, um, uh, studies showing that having, um, like enough fat helps you absorb the phytonutrients out of, um, plants like broccoli and spinach mm -hmm. and, and these cruciferous vegetables. So making sure you're just, you know, pouring a bunch of olive oil on it or, um, you know, ghee when you're cooking, that's also a good way to balance the vata uh, properties, vata Absolutely. aggravating properties. Absolutely. So really encouraging people to have the good fats in every meal. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay, great. And one other question on that list in turmeric, um, how much turmeric do you recommend on a daily basis? Um, pretty much as as much as possible. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think so, that's, yeah. There's really no limit, you know, okay. in terms of sa safety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, but practically speaking, yeah, um, I think uh, um, aiming for a uh, half teaspoon a, a day in okay, perfect. in in total with cooking. And then same thing with turmeric. Uh, if you uh, combine it with fat, like ghee, 
mm. you know, that increases the absorption. And then there was a study which uh, showed that combining turmeric with black pepper increases the absorption by 2000%. Right. So um, always uh, combining just a pinch of black pepper with the turmeric when you're cooking and then adding ghee, you know, that's the best way to, to maximize uh, turmeric. Perfect. Thank you for answering those questions. And so tell us a little bit about uh, the Paleovedic detox, Dr. Akil. Sounds very oh. interesting. Please. Yes. Yeah. So this is a... Um, uh, 21 day um, detox that I came up with that people can do at home, um, and uh, and 21 days is really like the minimum length of time uh, uh, for a, a, any detox because with the, the three doshas and then the seven datus or or tissues, you know, you you want to clear each um, tissue uh, layer for the three doshas. So that's the, the where the 21 days uh, comes from, mm-hmm. um, and um, yeah, it's basically combining um, a lot of the foods we just talked about, uh, you know, in terms of daily use, and then having people eliminate some of the harder um, things to digest. So um, taking out dairy products, this is only again for those three weeks, but uh, taking out taking out dairy products, taking out alcohol, um, taking out gluten in terms of uh, being harder to digest, um, and then just adding in all of these um, superfoods, which we talked about. And then potentially, if you're working with a practitioner, you may uh, also take some herbs uh, to help, you know, cleanse the liver and um, and detoxify. Um, and then I think a, a daily sauna is a, a key element of that as well in terms of sweating and releasing uh, releasing toxins through the skin. Okay, great. And there's lots more details and guidelines in your book. And can you tell listeners, Dr. Kill, where they can find out more about you, your book and your offerings? And I know you mentioned you have this online course as well. If you could tell us about that. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So my book, The Paleovedic Diet, is probably the best way um, for people to learn about my overall approach. And that's available from booksellers everywhere. And uh, yes, the online courses, I'm really proud of those. I've been working on those for a few years and I launched them recently. So I have uh, five online video courses that have been professionally produced uh, about Ayurveda and different topics. And um, the, the, the one that I think is most relevant to this uh, seminar is the Ayurveda and the Paleo Diet or a course, which okay. really covers all the aspects of the, the Paleo-Vedic diet. And it's uh, with the video that I, I've recorded um, talking about all the different topics. And uh, um, and then I um, have other, so the other four courses are on um, different spe- specific topics like uh, Ayurveda and autoimmune disease, um, Ayurveda and the thyroid. Uh, there's one on Ayurveda and brain health, and, um, and the final one on uh, anxiety, depression, and stress. So um, I've tried to uh, incorporate kind of the highlights with my approach and Ayurveda with each of these these topics. And I find that video works uh, better for most people because then um, they can just uh, you know uh, take in the information that way and you know replay things and and really listen. And and now that we're you know kind of more at home with the situation with COVID-19. I, I think people have more time to take in content through video. So Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Akhil, for coming on the show. And it was really interesting. I love how you've taken the paleo diet mm-hmm. and then combined it with Ayurveda. And the fact that you're incorporating more, that it's, it's less restrictive, it's less mm-hmm. rigid, and you're individualizing it. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, when people first uh, heard of this concept, they uh, often would tell me that, you know, this is uh, contradictory because (laughs) the paleo diet is so restrictive and Ayurveda really uh, espouses a more, uh, you know, broad and advanced diet. And, you know, uh, I think that um, the, um, the problem is when we don't understand what our Paleolithic ancestors really ate, then, you know, we might think that way, but they actually had a, a pretty broad diet. And uh, that's why I think um, uh, the problem is that when people restrict their diet too much, you know, you miss out on a lot of uh, essential nutrients yes. and, uh, and it's unnecessary. So I think uh, um, really figuring out what's best for each person and relying on your own experience with food, you know, your own intuition. Um, and listening to your body, I think ultimately that's the, the best source of wisdom. Absolutely. And I think Ayurveda provides a great framework once you, for that self-study. You start with understanding your, your, your makeup of your doshas and then, you know, studying yourself, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think, uh, 
yeah, I think self knowledge is really the, um, the the key to to begin. And Ayurveda has so much wisdom to offer. And uh, I think you know uh, that's really I think what gives people the the best guidelines is uh, combining ancient wisdom with uh, modern research and right. science and you know, the science of nutrition. Uh, because um, I think an integrative approach is really what I find you know that works best for people. Absolutely, absolutely, it's great. Well, Dr. Akhil, I appreciate you coming on the show. It was really great information today. So thank you so much. And I'll put all those links for everybody in the show notes. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, yeah, it was my pleasure, Colette. Thanks so much for um, having me on the show. I really enjoyed it. And uh, and thanks for all you do as well with the uh, Elements of Ayurveda podcast. Uh, it's a wonderful service to humanity that you've been uh, providing through that. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Akhil. Take good care of yourself. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Akhil. Certainly a very interesting approach in the Paleovedic diet. You can find all those links that Dr. Akhil mentioned over in the show notes, so please check them out. And if you think that this episode will be helpful to any family or friends, please share it with them. If you want to comment on the podcast episode, please do so over on the Elements of Ayurveda podcast Facebook group. If you want to support the podcast, if you like what you're hearing and you want to add your support, you can do so over on my Patreon page. I'll put that link in the show notes. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. I would truly appreciate that. You can find out more about my services over on elementshealingandwellbeing.com. And thank you so much for tuning in. Take good care of yourself. Be well and ciao for now.